The Cavalcade of America. Starring George Sanders in the Magnificent Medley on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. But first, here is Gain Whitman. We are all interested in anything that saves money. And when it prevents accidents as well, that's really good news. DuPont's Rug Anchor Rug Underlay does just that. This synthetic sponge rubber non-skid underlay not only makes your rugs stay put, but it increases wearability too. It's well worth the low cost for protection and longer life for your rugs. You can wash it with warm water and soap in no time at all. Now that Rug Anchor is back on the market, follow the lead of smart homemakers and use it under your rugs. Rug Anchor is one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Company presents The Magnificent Meddler, starring George Saunders as Dr. Benjamin Rush on The Cavalcade of America. Philadelphia, in the year 1789. The largest, most comfortable, most cultured city in the newly born United States of America. Philadelphia at the close of a summer day, resting beneath the long, quiet twilight, enjoying its harvest of hard-won peace and tranquility. But in a darkened room of the Philadelphia hospital, a doctor looks down upon the figure of a man lying inert on a rude cot and finds there neither peace nor tranquility. Owen! Owen, come here. Yes, Dr. Rush. What is it, sir? Is there something wrong, Dr. Rush? What's this patient doing in this ward? This patient? Why? Well, this is the only place we had to put him. And what's wrong with him? Well, we, we don't know yet, Dr. Rush. He, he was only brought in yesterday. But this ward's already overcrowded. And why is he pushed back into a corner? Why is he lying on that hard cot? Oh, don't let that bother you, Doctor. He doesn't know the difference. What do you mean, he doesn't know the difference? That mad Joseph. Someone found him lying in the street. He's quite mad, Doctor. And you've put a madman in this ward with all these other patients? Oh, there's nothing to worry about, sir. He's quite harmless. I'm not concerned about the harm he will do. What concerns me is the harm that will be done to him. He needs peace and quiet. He needs special care. Special care, Dr. Rush, for a madman? What do you know about him? Why, I, I don't know anything about him. But don't you know where he lives? No, sir. Or where his family is? We've asked around town, sir, but no one knows. Have you ever thought of asking him? Oh, that's no good, Doctor. He can't talk. He can't understand what you say to him. Oh, about that. Joseph. Joseph, do you hear me? Joseph, I'm a friend. I want to help you, Joseph. It's no good, sir. You can't do anything with him. What makes you think so? Well, I'm not a doctor, sir, but I've taken care of lots of madmen like him, and you can never do anything with them. Owen. Yes, sir? You listen to me and do just what I tell you. Get this man into a decent, clean bed where he'll get plenty of sunlight and air. But, Doctor... Do as I tell you. You are to see to it that no one bothers him or annoys him in any way. Now, do you understand that? Uh, yes, yes. I'll be back first thing in the morning to take a good look at him. Julia? Benjamin Rush, where have you been? There is a man here to see you, dear. They've been waiting nearly an hour. <laughs> Must be important, eh? What's it all about? Well, I don't know that, but I did overhear one of them complaining about your habit of meddling in things they say are none of your business. <laughs> Now, that could almost mean anything, Julia. Yes, I know it could, dear. Uh, Julia, have you ever heard of a man called Mad Joseph? Mad Joseph? The name sounds familiar. Oh, yes. The other afternoon, some children were teasing a man in the street, and I believe they called him Mad Joseph. Teasing him, eh? I wouldn't be surprised for little savages. Uh, Julia, uh, have you any idea where he came from, or... Who his family is? Well, no, Benjamin, I haven't. And do you suppose any of our friends might know? Well, it's not very likely, but I'll ask them, dear. Oh, please do, and the sooner the better. Now, uh, where are those men who are so eager to see me? They're waiting in the parlor. I'd as well see what they want and get it over with. Uh, Benjamin. Yes, Julia? Don't lose your temper, dear. Nonsense. You know perfectly well that I never lose my temper. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Oh, good evening. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. What can I do for you? Dr. Rush, my name is Watson. This is Mr. Allen and Mr. Dubois. Yes, I believe I've seen all of you at various times. Quite so. Now, Dr. Rush, we'd like to get right to the point. I'm at your service. You've been writing certain letters to the newspapers recently. I have. Dr. Rush, 
We dislike to resent the contents of those letters. Indeed. We don't agree with the viewpoint you express. Indeed. And we maintain there is not a word of truth in the accusations you make. Furthermore, you must do something about those letters. Uh, no, gentlemen. It is the people of Philadelphia who must do something about the conditions which are described in those letters. In fact, that was my purpose in writing them, to force public action. Look here, Rush. Those letters are full of a lot of nonsense about the proper treatment for madmen and lunatics. In the first place, the treatment of these people is none of your business. I'm afraid I disagree. But you're a doctor. Your concern is with people who are ill. Exactly. So those who are mentally ill are my business. Mentally ill? Do you call madmen mentally ill? I do. Rush, you know as well as we do that madness is no disease. Madness is a punishment for sins. And madmen are no more than lost souls. They're bewitched. That's what they are. But gentlemen, <laughs> believe me, madness is no punishment for sins or anything else. Nor is it a spell cast by witches. Madness is a disease, a disease of the mind. And for every disease, there is somewhere a cure. But scientifically, Doctor, what concrete proof have you of for this theory of yours? Unfortunately, very little. That is why I need your help. Dr. Rush, this whole affair is simply more of your meddling. Very well, I'm meddling. But for years, I've been trying to secure the proper care for these unfortunates, and my pleas have gone unheeded. And if your purpose in coming here today is to persuade me to withdraw my position and cease my efforts to eliminate this inhumane attitude, your time has been badly wasted. It is in our power to help those who are incapable of helping themselves. It is in our power to help in the fight against one of mankind's most dreaded enemies, an enemy against which none of us is immune. Gentlemen, I am a physician. It is my sworn and solemn duty to fight this fight and conquer this enemy, and I tell you now, that nothing shall be permitted to stand in my way. Gentlemen, I bid you good day. Oh, Benjamin. Eh? I was wondering if you were still interested in that man you were asking about. Uh, what man? The one you called Mad Joseph. Interested? Yes. I certainly am. Well, I don't know anything about the man himself, but his family lives on a farm not far from the city. How do you know? Tom told me. And who is Tom? Oh, he's the young man who delivers our milk and eggs. He said that Joseph's farm is quite near his. <laughs> you women have the most amazing ways of getting things done. <laughs> uh, did you also find out how to get there? Well, of course I did. You go out of the city by the north road, uh, and then... Never you... mind telling me, my dear. Just come along and show me. You mean now? This very minute. But, Benjamin, there's lemon pie for dessert. Your favorite I'll pie. I'll take a piece along now. Fetch your hat, Julia, and let's get started. That must be the house over there behind those trees, Benjamin. Yeah, we'll try it. Oh, dear me. What's wrong? Just look at that poor place. Uh, never mind about the house, Julia. It's the man who lives there that needs attention. Yes, I know. Here we are, dear. Down you come, Julia. Do you want me to go in with you? If you don't mind, I'd like this to look as much like a social call as possible. Of course. Mind your step, Julia. Oh, what a terrible litter of trash in this yard. Now, just come along. Watch these steps. Light burning. Who's there? Doctor and Mrs. Rush. What do you want? Does Joseph... Julia, I want his last name. Knight. Uh, does Joseph Knight live here? What do you want with Joseph Knight? We're looking for his family. What for? Well, we... Are you his... I'm his wife. Oh, I see. Uh, may we come in for just a little while, Mrs. Knight? Well, I suppose so. Thank you. Come along, Julia. This is Mrs. Rush, Mrs. Knight. How do you do? You'll have to sit wherever you find room. There's not much fancy here. Oh, we'll be very comfortable here. Thank you, Mrs. Knight. This is a pleasant little cottage. It was once. Mrs. Knight, I saw Joseph today. You did? Yes. He's in the city hospital. He is? Mrs. Knight, don't you care? Care? What's there to care about anymore? Mrs. Knight... How long have you known Joseph? All my life, I guess. And was he always... That is, was he always like he is now? 
You mean, was he always mad? Do you think I'd have married a madman? Uh, then how long has he been like this? Uh, a couple of years. Just when was it? Do you remember? Of course I remember, but what difference does it make? Mrs. Knight, I know this is hard on you, but it may make a great deal of difference. Please, won't you tell me about it? It was after... After Alice died. Alice? Uh, our daughter. Oh. She was only a baby. She got sick. There was no one here, only me, and, and it was winter. But well, Joseph was a good man, Doctor. It wasn't his fault if he couldn't get here to help. Where was he, Mrs. Knight? Why, with the army, of course. He was with General Washington's army. You mean Joseph was a soldier? One of the first to join up when the war started. I I sent word about the baby and I told him he could come home. He walked for days. He didn't sleep. Well, I know he did his best, but, but when he got here, she, she was gone. And then he went back. I didn't see him for nearly a year, and when I did see him, he was like that. Well, well, now you know, and what's the good of it? Why do you meddle in other people's misery? Why don't you just let me be? Mrs. Knight, what would you give to have Joseph well again? What would I give? Why do you say such things? Haven't you tortured me enough? You think it's impossible. But it may not be, if you help. Not Impossible. What do I have to do? I'm not sure at this moment, Mrs. Knight. But if you'll only trust me. If you work together with me, there must be a way. Joseph fought our fight for freedom for us, so now it's our turn to do battle for him. We must restore him to you, to himself, and to the nation he fought to make free. There must be a way for us to serve him now. Somewhere and somehow we've got to find that way. <clears throat> Mr. Owen, I've been looking for you. Where is Joseph? Joseph? Oh, you mean Mad Joseph. He's all right, Doctor. All right, but where is he? He's been dismissed from the hospital. You see, he was only... Uh, dismissed? Owen, I told you yesterday to see that no harm came to him. Oh, I did, sir. But you see, he really wasn't ill. He just hadn't eaten... Yes, so you fed him up and turned him loose? Well, what else was there to do? Go out and find him. Find him at once and bring him back here to me. Well, get started. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I was just coming to tell you, Doctor, that the hospital trustees are having a meeting. They're anxious to see you and want you to step in for a moment. With pleasure. Where are they? In the meeting room just down at the end of the hall. Thank you. And Owen, you find Joseph before I get through in there. Uh, I'll see to it, Dr. Rush. Quiet, please. Come in, Dr. Rush. We've been waiting for you. There are a few matters that we'd like to discuss. Uh, if you please, Mr. Coates, there are a few matters which I should like to take up with you. One matter in particular. Very well, Doctor. Proceed. Mad Joseph was found lying in the streets and brought here. I ordered that he be cared for and held until I could make an attempt to cure him. This morning, I find he's been dismissed and sent out to roam the streets again. Why? The hospital is overcrowded, and besides, you say the man is mad. Let us say, rather, that he is mentally ill. Oh, well, is there any difference? There's a great difference. Just as many people have bodies that are ill, uh, this poor fellow is ill in his mind. The mind is part of the body. Perhaps it can be treated and cured. Dr. Rush, I... One moment, please, Mr. Coates. There was a time when it was considered useless to attempt to cure even the simplest bodily sickness. We've come a long way from that time. Only in the realm of the mind and its ailments does this stubborn attitude remain. Less has been done to relieve the mentally ill than any other class of the afflicted. For centuries, they've been treated like criminals or shunned like unclean animals. But, Doctor, what do you suggest we do? Give me the authority and the funds to work with this man, Joseph. We owe him a debt of gratitude. He was a soldier in the Revolutionary Army, and it was the hardships he endured there that brought on his illness. Then, when we are successful with him, build a hospital for the mentally ill. Bring them all together in one spot and take them away from so-called normal men who jeer and sneer at them. Give them a place to rest, good food and proper care. Treat them as human beings. Hmm. Hmm? Well, it's possible your theory may have some worth. Very well. We'll wait to see the results you obtain with this mad Joseph. And now, Rush, if you please, can we get on with the business we called you in to discuss? 
Yes, we can. But, Mr. Coates, don't think I shall forget your promise in this matter. I shall not forget. Nor shall I allow you to do so. <laughs> George Sanders as Dr. Benjamin Rush in The Magnificent Meddler on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. When Dr. Rush convinced the regents to permit the continued treatment of Mad Joseph, he set about inaugurating humane methods of treatment for the relief of the mentally infirm. He was determined to prove his doctrines by curing Joseph, the insane veteran of General Washington's army. Good morning, Owen. How's our man Joseph coming along? Fine, sir. Seems to be picking up a little every day. Took his food himself this morning. But he still won't talk. Well, maybe a change of scene would do him good. Owen, I think it's time for Joseph to leave this hospital. You, you're going to turn him loose, sir? Not quite. But I'm going to send him home. And you're going with him. I, I am? Would you like to help cure him? Oh, you know I would, Dr. Rush. And I want you to take him home to his own farm. I want you to stay there with him. See to it that he remains very quiet at first. See to it that he's well-fed and comfortable. But I can do that here. But there's more to this treatment. His wife tells me Joseph used to be a fine farmer, and in his spare time used to carve wood. Now, in a few weeks, I want you to start him in again with his wood carving. It's possible, I think. It's just possible that if we divert him with simple things, keep him busy with the things he did and enjoyed doing, that his mind will rest and slowly heal itself. That's a strange idea, Doctor. But it's worth trying, isn't it? Anything is worth trying. No harm can come of it. His wife is getting the house and farm fixed up as best she can. She'll cooperate with you and follow your instructions. I won't get out there for at least two weeks, but I'll keep in close touch with you. Now, good luck, Owen, and thank you. I just a minute have with some supplies, Dr. Rush, but I thought I'd drop in let you know how things are going with Joseph. Yes, Owen. How is he? Well, not much change in his mental condition, Doctor, but he's in fine physical shape. Has he made an effort to speak yet? Not yet, Doctor. Does he seem to recognize anything? Does he know the house or his wife? Well, I can't be sure. Sometimes I think he does. Good, good. Owen, I'll be out there next week. Meanwhile, keep me informed. <laughs> What's the news? Good news, Dr. Rush. He's even better than when you saw him last week. Is he working with the wood? Well, he sort of hacks at it. Nothing comes of it yet, but he sits there for hours and seems to enjoy it. That's what I want. Something that will keep him interested. Make him forget himself and his troubles. I'm trying to get him to do work around the farm. Fine. But now we must be most careful. Be sure he gets no shock of any kind. Keep him in good physical condition. Don't let any strangers scare him. This is the crucial time. If he comes through this, Owen, we've won. Oh, Benjamin. Yeah, I'm very busy, dear. I know, dear, but you have some visitors. Well, I can't see anyone now. Please, Benjamin, they're so eager to see you. No, very well. Send them in. <laughs> they're right here behind me, dear. Joseph. Mrs. Knight. Hello, Dr. Rush. I'm sorry to disturb you. Disturb me? Nothing. Come in and sit down. Joseph, give it to the doctor now. Now? Can I give it to him now? Doctor, he spoke. For the first time, doctor, he spoke. Yes, Joseph. What is it? Doctor, Rush, I have something for you here. I have something for you. You have, Joseph? What is it? A little wooden box. I made it myself. Joseph, this is very nice. He's been working on it for six weeks, Doctor. And a lovely job he's done, too. You like it? Joseph, I, I can't tell you how much I like it. I can't tell you how much this little wooden box means to me. To us, too, Doctor. 
Yes, my dear, I know it. You too. I can now predict with confidence that in a matter of a few months, Joseph will be perfectly normal. Gentlemen, Dr. Rush has the floor. Uh, Mr. Coates, you have seen this man, Joseph. Will you tell the committee his present state of health as opposed to what it was? Well, he seems to be perfectly normal. Seems? Gentlemen, I assure you he is normal and has been so for the past three months. There's been no relapse and no indication that there may be one. Now, I am not claiming that this can be done for all who are mentally ill, but it can be done for many. I beg you to grant funds for a mental hospital. Believe me, this request goes deeper than the well-being of individuals. This request affects the entire future welfare of this country for what all of us thought. It was my privilege to help create this nation with my signature on the Declaration of Independence. Yet I know that my work and Joseph's sacrifice will be wasted, utterly wasted, unless steps are taken to protect and maintain the well-being and health of all of our citizens. These may, may seem strong words to you, yet you must realize that a nation is no stronger than the people who make up that nation. You gentlemen are in a position to serve our people. Serve them by creating this special hospital. Serve them by recognizing madness for the disease it is and by providing the means to conquer it, and you will have served them well. Mr. Coates, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Have you any news? Rush, you are wasting your time in the practice of medicine. Well, I, I don't understand. The hospital trustees had quite a discussion this afternoon after you left us. Yes? You're a powerful orator, Rush. Yes? Well, do I have to draw pictures, man? You've got your hospital. I, I have the hospital. The necessary funds were approved almost as soon as you left the room. Well... When will the new building be started? <laughs> oh, never satisfied, eh, Rush? Well, it'll be started just as soon as you give the word. Oh, immediately. Start it immediately. Oh, right, immediately then. Oh, you're a headstrong, meddling man, Rush. But I guess you know what you're talking about. Thank you for your support, Mr. Coates. This is a great moment. A great moment for all of us. Are you busy, Dr. Rush? Oh, no, no. Come on in, Owen. I thought you might like to look over this report. Report? Yes, sir. The first annual report of the Philadelphia Hospital for the Mentally Ill. Well, well, sounds mighty impressive, doesn't it? <laughs> so, it's been a whole year since we started. Hardly seems possible. You won't say that after you see this report, Doctor. Good. Just look at this list of discharged patients. Yes. But only the simplest cases, I'm afraid, Owen. They weren't considered so simple before we started to work with them, Doctor. Nevertheless, I'm thinking of the failures we've had, the seemingly hopeless failures. Well, that's for the future to take care of, I suppose. Dr. Rush, do you really think that sometime all these people can be cured? Sometime, Owen, yes. Although I don't think you and I will see that time. But we have seen the end of clanking chains and the lash of whips in the madhouse. Our sufferers now taste the blessings of air and light. They've regained their standing as human beings. Yes, even these things are not the true end of our battle. Indeed, this battle is not merely to feed and clothe their bodies, nor yet is it merely to cure their disease. It's... Well, how shall I put it? It's... It's to restore the disjointed mind of a fellow human being to its normal state. To revive in him the things for which a human being lives and breathes and fights. And to restore in him the knowledge of himself, his world, and his God.
Our star, George Sanders, will return to our cavalcade microphone in a moment. Now, here is Gaines Whitman. One of the most bothersome problems in making steel is that of getting rid of scale. Scale is a thin film of impurities. The film covers the metal, and it must be removed in one way or another before the steel is used. But how? How do you get the scale off? Rub it off? Pay somebody to pick it off, or what? These aren't foolish questions. Practically every square foot of steel made gives the manufacturer this problem. How to make it clean and shining. Scale removal offers an example of the way chemistry solves many manufacturing problems quickly and cheaply. The scale that troubles the steel maker is largely an iron oxide. DuPont has developed a process in which hot rolled steel rod, wire, or sheet is dipped in a fused caustic bath containing sodium hydride. A chemical reaction takes place, and the scale is changed to ordinary iron. The iron is in the form of a powder. It can be washed off easily with a hose. It sounds simple, and it is simple once you know how. Finding out how was something else again. DuPont research groups worked on the process for three years. This chemical method, the DuPont sodium hydride descaling process, which requires very little equipment and very little work, cleans all grades of alloy steels uniformly and thoroughly. And it does it without making the steel brittle or eating any of it away. If by accident the metal is left in the bath too long, no harm is done. The time required is from 15 seconds to 20 minutes. The DuPont process also works on nickel, copper, monel, and a number of other metals. In one way or another, you and I use a lot of steel. We have stainless steel implements in our kitchens. We patronize stainless steel soda fountains. We wear wristwatches with stainless steel backs. So everything that can help the steel manufacturer to reduce his cost is very much to our interest. And that is exactly what chemistry has done. Chemistry of DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. And now, here again is George Saunders. <laughs> and next Monday, that'll be Christmas Eve, Cavalcade has a special surprise for you. Frank Morgan will be on hand to star in an unusually delightful program. You will be at home next Monday night, maybe with that son or husband who has been away so long. Maybe you'll be decorating your tree or wrapping up your last minute presents. Won't you join us on Christmas Eve for Names on the Land, starring Frank Morgan, on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. <laughs> for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our Cavalcade play was written by Lee Shane and was based on the book Benjamin Rush by Nathan Goodman. George Saunders may soon be seen in A Scandal in Paris, a United Artists release. This is Tom Collins inviting you to listen next week to Frank Morgan in Names on the Land on the Cavalcade of America. Brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.